A very warm welcome to everyone who just joined us on this section on the risking women farmers through innovative insurance. I'm Doris Ibekwe. Welcome. I'm Doris Ibekwe, consultant at Global Index Insurance Facility at GIF IFC, and it's my pleasure to be moderating today's panel discussion. So before we begin, while hopefully a few others are joining us, I will cover a couple of housekeeping items. So first, each presenter in this section will have a total of 10 minutes for their presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be time for Q&A section. And for the audience, as we move through the section, if you have any questions for the presenter, please use the chat feature at the bottom in this section to ask your question. At the end, I will be reading out your questions. And as a, as a participant, you are allowed to direct your question to, to a speaker of choice. And before you do that, we encourage you to please introduce yourselves, and tell us where you are connecting from, your name and your organization. So we hope to have an exciting panel discussion today as we have a fantastic line of speakers joining us to share their views and their fake text fees in this area. I'll introduce everybody now, and I'll tell you about the agenda briefly. So first, it's my honor to introduce Regina Kisler. She is a senior policy officer in the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development of Germany, BMC. She is also responsible for, for several programs under Ensure Resilience Global Partnership, the leading global initiative to scale up climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. Prior to joining BMZ, she worked with the Inclusive Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division of the Food and Agriculture Organization, FOA of the United Nations with a regional focus on North Africa and the Sahel. Ms. Kisler holds a master's degree in political science and a master's degree in sustainable development cooperation. Our, sec our second speaker is Fatou Giwa. She is the IFC Women's Insurance Program Lead. She has over 20 years of experience in leading programs, capacity building projects and advisory services in Africa. Before joining IFC, Fatou worked with the UN Women Deputy Country Representatives in DRC, heading both programs and operations. She has led gender initiatives across countries to advance gender equality and women empowerment. Prior to, to, to UN Women, Fatou was the IFC's Women in Banking Champions for, for Sub-Saharan Africa. She was in charge of gender advisory programs in Sub-Saharan Africa and SME banking projects in West Africa and Central Africa. Our third speaker is Sarah Ibrahim. Sarah is an operations officer for the Women's Insurance Program team within the IFC's Gender and Economic Inclusion Group. Her team advises insurance in emerging markets on the business case for becoming the insurer and employer of choice for women and has co-created women's insurance programs that bring innovative products to market. Prior to join the IFC six years ago, she worked at the Inter-American Development Bank, IDB Lab, and had previously held various consulting positions across Latin America and the Caribbean. She has a master's degree in public policy and development management from Georgetown University, and a BSc in finance from the University of Delaware. Our fourth speaker is Tuga Alaskari. Tuga is an advisor at the Secretariat of the Insurance Resilience Global Partnership, IGP, and lead of the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. IGP is a global initiative striving to foster climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. Prior to this, she worked for the World Food Program, Asian Development Bank, and African Risk Capacity. She was engaged in the design and deployment of disaster risk financing and insurance initiative across Africa and Asia. Tuga has a BA honors in politics, philosophy, and economics from the University of Essex. 
and an MSc in development from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. Our fifth speaker is Rose Goslinga. Rose is the president and co-founder of Bula, a company that is radically restructuring agricultural insurance through the use of technology. Bula has facilitated crop insurance for more than 4 million small smallholder farmers in 13 African countries since 2015 and has over the last year raised $60 million to the rich smallholder farmers across Africa. Rose's work in agriculture insurance has been recognized by Financial Times IFC Award for Sustainable Finance, InsurTech 3.0 Clarebooks Award, and the Singapore FinTech Festival. She holds an MSc in Political Economy of Development from the University of London and a BSc in Business Economics. She's Arena Arnold Holt, Fellow and a social innovation fellow from PopTech and also a TED speaker. Okay, so let's look at the agenda for the, at the agenda for today. First of all, we have um, Regina Kisler from BMZ. BMZ is a long-term donor to G program and has been a key supporter to our program. Uh, she will be giving today's opening remarks, and after that, kicking off the section will be Fatu Giwa from IFC, she'll be covering IFC Sheep for Shield, ensure women to, to better protect all research reports. And also we'll have Sarah from IFC presenting IFC's, IFC's recent study on mobilizing insurance for rural women farmers in Nigeria. Next, we'll have Tuga from Insure Resilience. The Insure Resilience Global Secretariat is a global initiative with multiple implementing partners in the field of climate and disaster risks and insurance. They are also very active through their work on the ground. And also through their subcommittees, one of which the gender working group, the women insurance team, uh, the women insurance program team is an active player of this working group. She will be introducing the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions sharing insights on their work, addressing gender gaps, and the application of climate and disaster risk financing and insurance. Last but not the least, we have Rose Goslinga from Pula. She will share insights on Pula's work, focusing on agricultural insurance premiums in Africa, and innovative solutions to improve product design and access and distribution. Now, let's welcome our keynote speaker for today, Regina Kisla. Over to you, Regina. Thank you, Doris, and I hope you can hear me well. Perfectly. Thank you. Then uh, let me start with thanking you very much for the invitation. Being from a family farm myself, I'm delighted to give the opening remarks today, but also to have the opportunity to learn from you and more about all of your activities. We have a very interesting set of presentations and discussions ahead of us, I'm convinced, with a great diversity of expertise that has been brought together here today to explore innovative insurance solutions. While barely anyone feels the impact of climate change as much as farmers do in countries of the global south, there are constraints increasing the vulnerability of certain groups even further, including women, as we all know, prevailing gender norms and discrimination, underrepresentation of women and limited access of women and girls to finance and resources shape the gender dimension of climate risk. The Injury Resilience Global Partnership brings together over 110 members, including industrialized as well as vulnerable countries. It backs a common vision to strengthen the resilience to climate and disaster shocks through the scale up of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. And in this context, enhancing gender equality is crucial to the partnership. So let me briefly explain to you how this is integrated in and promoted by the partnership. Germany is a co-chair of the Insure Resilience High Level Consultative Group, HLCG for short, the highest political steering body of the partnership. 
In 2019, we jointly adopted the Insure Resilience Vision 2025, setting ambitious global targets for the entire community working on risk finance. The vision prominently calls for gender mainstreaming. So to this end, in 2020, the HLCG endorsed the Declaration on Gender, marking an important milestone and offering a firm signal of the commitment to consolidate and strengthen efforts of the partnership to promote comprehensive, gender responsive approaches for risk finance. To put this declaration into action, the HLCG mandated the establishment of the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. This platform works towards playing a key role in identifying gender equitable disaster risk management strategies. And furthermore, it aims to guide practitioners on innovative solutions to transform the CDRFI sector towards being more gender sensitive and leading the way on greater gender equality. I'm proud to say that this unique platform, which Germany and Canada are driving forward hand in hand, was launched at the UNF Triple C COP26 in Glasgow last year. So it is now ready for all of you to engage, whether it is studies or live talks or expert exchanges. It is the community, as you know, that brings such a center of excellence to life. We are in the fortunate position that we have Tuga Alaskari, lead of the Insure Resilience Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions, with us today as a panelist. She will be sharing some early insights from this work on gender transformative action in the area of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance. So let me stop here and wish all of us now a fantastic event on de-risking women farmers through innovative insurance. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Chris, Re Regina, for that insightful um, opening. Thank you um, for a great opening and your continued support. Um, now let's please welcome our next presenter, Fatu Giwa of the Women Insurance Program, IFC. Over to you, Fatu. Thank you so much, Doris. Uh, so glad to be here today and uh, just saying good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. And uh, really happy to be here today and talk about our first of its kind report on women and the insurance during the second day of the Sankal Summit. So um, our program enables insurance company to better target women as customer and distributors. So as uh, you know, in IFC, the International um, Finance Corporation, um, we uh, really uh, play a unique role as strategic partners to the insurance sector in emerging and developing market through our investment and advisory services. And we've been working with more than 400 clients, both in the banking and insurance sector, and we focus on gender, climate, financial inclusion, you know, new technology, corporate governance, just to name a few. We also create markets and we want the markets to be competitive, we want them to be inclusive, we want them to be sustainable. And of course, the insurance sector is critical to that effort and we can't perform, it can't uh, perform to its full potential, you know, without actively targeting women as customer. Thank you. So um, when we say targeting women as customers, what we first did was in 2015, we conducted a first research just to understand better the relationship between women and insurance and the insurance industry. And we did it with the AXA Group and Accenture. And that report really provided us with an understanding on how much growth the women market alone represents for the insurance industry and what women want and need uh, in terms of insurance product and services. And also it gives us recommendation as of how to attract and retain women as vital clients. What we did was both primary and secondary research. And we did that across 10 markets. And we find quite some very interesting data that we'll be showing in the next slide. 
So as I was saying, the she for shield report that we are kind of very proud of really highlighted that the women are underserved segment for the insurance industry. It also laid out the role that the insurance sector has in job creation for women, particularly as agent, who in turn can help reach more women customers. So what we first found was really a very big opportunity because what we saw is that the 2030 annual premium value of the women global market is predicted to grow approximately twice the size of the 2013 market. So as you see, increasing from 770 billion to 1.7 trillion. And more importantly of this growth, 50% will be coming from emerging market. The report also you know, revealed a quite very interesting insight and trends um, as the, you know, regarding the women and their relationship to insurance. So when you look at the women from cradle to grave, there are eight potential tipping points in their life for which they need insurance coverage. So when starting to work, when they are pregnant, have children, get married, want to buy a property, just to name those few. And what we've seen is that those tipping points constitute opportunities for insurance company that can diversify their portfolio and increase their revenue. So providing better protection for women is an investment in society as women tend to reinvest up to 90% of their income back in their children's education, nutrition, and health needs, which make them a vehicle of growth for their family and society well-being. There is also a great opportunity to create more jobs having women as insurance agent and distributor. Now, the question is, what are the key driver behind the opportunity that we see in the women's market? And we'll see it in the next slide. We'll see that it's really through two buckets. We have the increased participation of women in the economy, but we also see the evolving role that they are having and that need to be protected. So women are getting more educated. They are getting tertiary education. And what does it mean? It means increase in the income compared to you know, before. More women also are working and they have higher level of entrepreneurship. On the other side also, you have women getting married much later. Um, and I just to give you- uh, We hello, did lose you a little bit here that we are back on. We did have a little yeah. glitch. We lost oh, you after the delayed marriage, Fatu. You can pick up at delayed marriage. Mm -hmm. Thank okay, you, okay, sorry. So they are getting married late. Um, the, there's an increase in the divorce rate, but also what we see is that when uh, women are single and heading households, they need more assistance and risk coverage. And just to give you an example, in Bangladesh, 12.5% of all households are women headed. So we really see a potential there to be able to support them and give them a risk coverage. We also see that women have longer life expectancy uh, with the gender pay gap. So they need protection for themselves, for their family. And also they are willing to invest more in education and health for their family. As we know, you know with the caregiving responsibility, they are likely to have larger burden on themselves. You know, and when they need money, they borrow from their friends and they do it in an informal way. So these are really the key drivers that make that opportunity, that explain that opportunities uh, for the insurer company to be able to look through um, these uh, potential. Next slide, please. So we've seen the opportunity, but what is even more interesting is that women are valuable clients for insurer. And why is that? Their economic contribution to their household is increasing. That's what we've just seen. And so they can bargain, the, their spending power is uh, higher, but also they are more willing to spend in insurance because they need more protection. So they are more willing to spend than men compared to men against the risk. And for them, security of mind is key. So what our research show is that countries like Nigeria, China, Mexico, women are willing to spend 20% of their income to protect themselves against risk in the future. 
And in those same country, when you compare it to the men, it goes between seven, 10 percent. So it really show um, that uh, growth potential. Same, when women sell, when, uh, sorry, when they purchase insurance for themselves, they don't only look at themselves. What, what I mean is they act as a conduit to the whole family. And as we've seen before, 90% of their revenue can go to their children, education, nutrition, and health need. But also we have 85% of the family wallets that are detained by women. So the more you have women customers, you have the chance of bringing 85% of the family wallet of your women customers. So not only are women a promising economic opportunity, but their behavior and role make them attractive clients. So insurers need to unlock the potential of that women's market. And the next slide will tell you, show you how. So what needs to be done is look at the insurance value chain and be able to develop a comprehensive strategy. And that will involve what? Understanding better the market, which means doing market research, being able to develop solution, look at the distribution, look at the claim management and so on. So as I said, first step, build intelligence to understand what the women want, what they need and what their aspirations are. Because we know that one size doesn't fit all. So the insurers need to tailor the recommendation of the characteristic of each of their market, but also the women's segment and be able to develop for each of those segments products that are tailored to the needs. They also need to improve distribution and be close to their clients. And that means incorporating digital tools, building partnership and so on. Because what we've seen through the research is that women agents build the relationship with their clients compared to men that are more transactional in terms of doing business. So being able to have more women to build that trust, to build those type of relationship uh, place the insurer in a, a position where they are able to not only acquire, but sell and retain their customers. Now we will be moving into the sex disaggregated data and why is it important? As you've seen previously, the first step in uh, building a market, in having a women's market is to build intelligence, to know more about the market because the lack of sex disaggregated data hinders the company's ability to identify gaps and be able to implement corrective measure. And you also know, if you want to measure something, you have to start with the baseline. So you start by being able to disaggregate your uh, portfolio and be able to understand internally what you have. And then being able to venture in that new segment, you are not alone. You need to bring the whole company with you which means that being able to build the case, have a clear business case through internal analysis, sizing of the market so that you can determine the potential market share and profit. So with that data-backed business case, you are able to um, get the first step in evaluating an investment decision and gaining support internally to do a feasibility study, and be able to implement a uh, women market. So we'll also talk a little bit, um, winding down here, I'm sure, <laughs> looking at the time. So um, we also want to touch a little bit on the COVID-19. And as you know, the economic impact of uh, the COVID-19 has been devastating. So emerging evidence really suggests that the crisis um, have uh, uh, had a really have, sorry, a disproportionate impact on women compared to men. It has worsened gender gap, including the financial protection gap for women. And what we did last year, and I'm sure Sarah will be sharing with you the guidance uh, note in the chat box, is that we published uh, a note on the role that insurer can play in supporting women, employees, and customer. And uh, it will be great for you to be able to read it and see what has happened so far. And uh, just to the next slide to give you um, just a snapshot of what we've seen. We've seen that uh, during the period motor claim went down, the demand for health. Hello. Hello Fatu, we did lose you a little bit. And 
Yeah, this you can round up now. Yeah, ten minutes. Hello, can you still hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. Okay, great. So I was just sharing one of the um, the the five points we've seen through the the guidance note and on how the industry has responded. What we've seen where that the motor claims uh, went down, but we're a kind of returning to normal. The demand for health insurance uh, went up and the new product, new solution were launched. So the insurance industry was able at a certain point quickly uh, respond to the need. Um, they provided information, advice and financial support uh, to be able to retain. And we've seen that some of them were able to retain their customers. Of course, uh, flexible work was there. And uh, we've seen that more women were really attracted to it given their care responsibility. And last but not least, um, you know, it's about business interruption. What we've seen is that some of the insurer were able to kind of cover that. Um, and for example, we've seen in Kenya that um, the IRA um, for some of the claims were able to uh, advocate for the insurance company to do some payoff while in other uh, countries, it was not so obvious. So just sharing some uh, uh, points uh, on the guidance note we've shared, uh, we've, uh, we've done and uh, happy to, to discuss more um, about it. Thank you so much. And uh, I guess I'll pass it over now to Sarah. Right, Doris, or just to you? Yeah. Thank to you. Thank you, yeah. Fatu, for, for that insightful presentation and the highlights on the needs of women, their potential as key clients as well. So um, let us, uh, before we go to the next speaker, let's remember to please um, to remember that every speaker has 10 minutes as we move on to, to our next speaker, who is uh, Sarah Ibrahimi from the Women Insurance Program, IFC. Over to you, Sarah. Thank Thanks you. so much, Doris. And thank you, Fatu. I know that we have um, we have a lot of new faces in the audience. So it's always good to really set the stage for why is the women's insurance opportunity an important one? And why should we even be focusing on women as, as employees, as well as part of the sales force, and of course, as customers. So today I'm gonna to be speaking about brand new research. This is the first time that we've presented it publicly. So you are all part of a very exclusive group. But as Doris said, my name is Sarah Ebrahimi. I'm a member of IFC's Women's Insurance Program. I've been with them for six years now. And this is the first time that we've done research of this type. So very excited to be able to share it with you all. So as Fatu explained across IFC, we have several different groups that are working on the subject of insurance. And one of them is also the Global Index Insurance Facility, and that is the GIF. So the GIF, along with the Women's Insurance Program, we've both seen through our work in emerging markets that insurance really can help manage the risks of rural women, but there is a gap between the awareness insur of insurance companies, the availability of products in the market, and of course, the needs and preferences of, of customers, especially women customers. And so we conducted a research to really try to better understand this gap and what the insurance industry can do to close the gap between the availability of products and what women actually need and want. So to do this research, we conducted um, interviews with 400 surveys, sorry, with 458 rural women farmers. We had 12 different farmers, farmer focus groups across Nigeria. We had interviews with 30 different women that lead agribusiness SMEs. And we had interviews with 16 different insurance uh, industry stakeholders. And so while the full report is not published yet, my presentation today is gonna give an overview of our methodology, some key findings and next steps, and hopefully inspire all of you to take action in some way to help close these gaps. Now, in addition to myself, we're fortunate to have Joanna Farrell joining us in the chat. Joanna is co-founder and CEO of Agramondis, which is the research firm that conducted this work on the ground. And she's here today to conduct, to answer any specific questions that you have about the methodology or the findings. And just as a bit of background, Agramondis is a research and consulting firm that specializes in agribusiness, monitoring and evaluation, research and development. They have headquarters in Nigeria with offices in Kenya, Germany, and the UK. And their focus is in Africa and emerging markets globally. Next slide. So what did we find? Why are women 
what is the importance of rural women in Nigeria? Why did we choose to focus our research on rural women? Well, first and foremost, as you heard during Fatu's presentation, women are a tremendous market opportunity, but more so rural women in Nigeria. So in addition to the growth opportunities that they present, we found four key reasons why we really wanna focus on rural women farmers and women-owned agribusiness SMEs. The first is the low insurance penetration rate in Nigeria, only 5% of adults are estimated to have insurance with men being 2.4 times more likely to be insured compared to women. There's of course a high population of rural women farmers and estimated that rural women farmers make up 26% of the entire population. There's a high percentage of female entrepreneurship in Nigeria. It's estimated that there's 23 million female entrepreneurs and that they own approximately 41% of all, all micro businesses. And that there's equal opportunities for, if there were equal opportunities for women, this would increase our agriculture output. They estimate that if women were given the same access to, access to resources as men, agricultural input would increase by two and a half to four percent. Next slide, please. So we also, so who were the women that we surveyed? Who was on the ground? Well, we found that 67% of them accessed their farmland through ownership, inheritance, or family member, whereas 24%, they rent their land. Found that 97% of them were crop farmers, and that 52% were both crop and livestock farmers. 81% had other sources of income outside of farming, meaning that they were selling farm or non-farm products and had other forms of employment. The rural women that we interviewed had, uh, were focused on meeting their day-to-day -day needs. They wanted to intend to continue farming, and they also were, as you saw, involved in other generating uh, income generating activities. The primary concerns of rural women, they were really concerned about their basic needs, their families being number one, especially their food and health care. They were worried about their children's education, paying the school fee, and of course, stressed from juggling domestic duties and their child care while also farming. The key events in their life for them where they had the most change and stress was around marriage, pregnancy, childbirth, and funeral ceremonies. But there's also, with regards to funerals, there's a lot of negative taboo around anticipating or planning for things such as funerals, which rep may represent having a lack of faith. So of course, our research other also covered agribusiness SMEs, and we saw that agribusiness SMEs, their primary constraints included small profit margins, debt, and a lack of capital to be able to expand their businesses. And the main risks that they faced were a loss of customers, price fluctuations, and government policies, and the rising cost of inputs. Next slide. So what should, insurance know, what should insurers know about rural women? Well, as you see on the slide here, we've included some great quotes, but we also want to share a little bit more. We found that 70% of women, they've heard about insurance, but only 3% of those we interviewed had any form of insurance. They showed a high interest about the concept and how it would benefit their livelihood. Some of them were covered by MFIs or aggregators, but they weren't aware that they even had insurance. So making women be aware of coverage that they already have is very important. We found that for agribusiness SMEs, they had heard of insurance, but not necessarily business or agriculture insurance in particular, and that the average woman did not tend to see much value add about insurance simply because of their lack of awareness or education about it. Now, women's perception about insurance, as we've seen in all industries, negative experiences and low payout rates have really done a lot to impact trust. So insurance companies may be seen as untruthful, unreliable. They've heard about negative experiences from peers. And with regards to SMEs, they did not see um, they might not have had business or agriculture, but they did think that once they were explained the concept of insurance, that it could be beneficial to them to help um, insure against unplanned events. And as you can see on the bottom of the screen, we found that, that women and businesses were willing to spend between one and 12 US dollars a month on insurance. And according to them, they would have had, um, they prefer to pay um, at the end of the season. Very few would be able to pay upfront or mid-season. Next slide. 
So what are women's insurance needs? I listed a lot of information here. These slides will be circulated, but just to dive into a few specific things with regards to health insurance, uh, innovative health insurance products such as prenatal care, postnatal care, maternity insurance would really be seen as a big value add. Um, we found that awareness raising was really important, that women prefer one-on-one -on -one communication and leveraging local champions in the field who can help share their experience among peers. We also found that pre-financed insurance premiums that can be deducted from farm input loans or can be deposited from their savings would really help avoid disruption in their daily lives. As we saw here, not only is it about having the right innovations and right solutions for women, but also having the right avenues to reach women. Uh, we found that savings associations and informal savings groups were really seen as a good channel um, due to the trust that was developed by women. Another way was to have insurance companies really focus on employing more women in the field staff. That would help build trust. And of course, playing claims transparently and on a timely basis. I know I shared a lot of information in, in the short time, but this was really just tip of the iceberg in terms of the great information that we found. We will be sharing these slides as well as publishing the full report very soon. Um, I saw that there's already a couple questions in, coming in through the chat, which we will definitely, um, definitely be addressing during the Q&A. But for now, over to Tuga, because I know that I've, wor I've worked with Tuga for years now. She's fantastically knowledgeable and passionate, and I am so delighted that she's able to join us. So over to you, Tuga. Thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you for having me at this conference. Um, I've already I've been busy taking notes. Uh, there are so many insights that you've all been sharing that are very interesting um, to me and also application to our central on gender smart solutions. Um, so as um, introduced briefly by Regina in the opening, um, so I work for the Insure Resilience Global Partnership and I'm the lead for the Insure Resilience Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. Hello Tsuga, we did lose you a little bit. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yes. You can hear me now? Yes, correct. Great, great. So I'll dive right in. Um, so if we could go to the next slide, please. So as mentioned by uh, Regina in the opening, so the Insurance and its Global Partnership, we have over 110 members and um, the members work together behind a common vision, which is to strengthen the resilience of developing countries and to protect the lives and livelihoods of poor and vulnerable people against the impacts of disasters. The way this is done is through enabling more timely and reliable disaster response through the use of climate and disaster risk finance and insurance solutions. We have a number of work streams. So we work through, for example, convergence and you know, advocacy at a global level, working through the different uh, policy platforms that exist and really trying to show that disaster risk financing and insurance is a very integral part of resilience building and adaptation. In addition to that, we have um, action and implementation through members of our partnership that are working very concretely on the ground to scale up access to disaster risk finance and insurance. We also have a work stream on capacity building and knowledge management, which is a strong pillar of the work that we do. And in addition to that, we look at um, creating a collaborative network. We recognize that members of, we have members from, as uh, Regina mentioned, government representatives, private sector, development sector, NGOs, academia, bringing that all together so that we really enhance knowledge and action on climate disaster risk finance and insurance. But uh, running across our entire Vision 2025, we have two cross-cutting objectives. One of them is what we call pro-poor approach, really looking at the impact on people, taking a people-centered approach in all our work. Um, so not getting too tied up on, you know, just the numbers of how many people are affected, but also going deeper and looking at the impact. How are these projects actually improving people's livelihoods, building their resilience, um, addressing poverty and so on. And then a second cross-cutting objective um, is gender mainstreaming, which I'd like to zoom in a little bit more on. When we set out, um, we had a very interesting discussion with our governing board, um, our governing body, the high-level consultative group. And they were saying, you know, gender mainstreaming is very important, but what does that actually mean? And we realized that there were a lot of gaps in translating that into action. There are knowledge gaps, and we needed to really make a concerted effort 
to raise the knowledge about this, raise our own knowledge about this, and to um, foster the, um, the different partners that needed to take action on this. So if we go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit more about the Centre of Excellence. It all started with a study. So in the beginning, we, we, we wanted to have this gender mainstreaming um, objective, and we said, let's try and um, understand where the gender gaps are. We commissioned two studies, and they found um, some very important, um, they came up with some very important findings. So firstly, there is quite uh, some documented evidence of the differential impact of climate change and disasters on people of different genders. So we could, we needed to already from the get go start to speak, uh, look at the differential vulnerabilities, the different ways that people are impacted. Um, there's also issues related to financial inclus inclusion um, and also many of the projects that we were working with were potentially focusing a lot on formal employment structures that existed and in doing so without meaning to leaving out and creating potentially exacerbating gender differences. Um, and then there are many statistics here. I think in the interest of time, um, I won't go through all of them, but there was a strong imperative for us to better understand the differences, to take a closer look at the projects and look at where there are entry points to redress these imbalances. So to do so, we launched the Ensure Resilience Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. Um, we did this at COP26 just recently in November in Glasgow um, at a high level event. And this was already after a year of work. We had a soft launch in 2020. Um, and we started to work with our members of our partnership. We have a gender working group. Sarah is a member of the, uh, the gender working group and maybe some of you uh, listening today. And we really tried to pull together what information exists out there. Wh who's doing what? Where are the, wh what's the evidence base? What examples do we have of good practice? Where um, can we share knowledge among different members of our partnership? And what can the center of excellence do to address these gaps? Um, so if we go to the next slide, um, so the Centre of Excellence um, on Gender Smart Solutions um, has the vision to uh, have gender smart approaches um, understood and applied to climate disaster risk finance insurance, which is the focus of the Insure Resilience Global Partnership mandate. And the idea is to strengthen the resilience of poor and vulnerable people who are differentially impacted by climate change and disasters. Um, and the objective is to guide practitioners and poly policymakers on innovative, inclusive, gender responsive and sensitive quality CDRFI solutions and to address the specific gender and intersectional needs of poor and vulnerable people. We also realize that we can't say that, you know, women are a certain way and men. We recognize that there are intersectional vulnerabilities um, where people, we need to recognize that, you know, gender and disability, um, migration and disability, all sorts of differences that people are facing. So we need to start to have that lens when designing and developing disaster risk finance and insurance solutions in order to not um, leave people out. Um, we have four pillars in the Center of Excellence on Gender Smart Solutions. One of them is knowledge and evidence. So we're gathering research that exists out there. We're also finding the areas where there might be gaps and we're working with our partners to commission research to address these gaps. We separated out the second pillar. It could have been knowledge, evidence, and guidance, but we realized there's quite a lot of knowledge out there, lots of research that says these are the gaps. You know, um, this is what's needed. For example, we need gender disaggregated data. But to convert that to action, we need to look a bit closer and develop very easy to use guidance notes. What, for example, the um, gender disaggregated data, what data is that? Are we just going to count how many men and women are covered in a project? What are the questions we should be asking to truly understand right through the project cycle from the design to the implementation to the evaluation? What kind of questions we should be asking to ensure that we're not missing something out related to gender differences? Um, in addition to that, we have an opportunity pillar. So one example of a, an activity under this is we have a scholarship program where we find uh, where women in leadership um, in insurance supervisory bodies um, in the global south can apply and they benefit from this leadership and diversity course, which takes part, um, it's uh, by the uh, Women's World Banking and the University of Oxford uh, Said Business School. 
and the Centre of Excellence funds uh, the participation of, uh, uh, of participants in this, pro uh, in this program. And they come in, what's interesting about this course is not only do they go and benefit from the leadership and diversity training, but they take with them a policy idea that they want to implement in their country and they can work on it with others in the course with experts and then when they go back not only do they have um, greater knowledge about leadership and diversity and gender issues but they also have um, they're better prepared to implement their policy idea we're now adding um, an additional component to that which is a coaching component so after they return to their country they can also benefit from additional coaching to support with that transformation of the sector that they are working on and uh, the policy reform and the final one is community um, we're really fostering a platform for collaborative network we want as many exchanges we want to connect people we want to connect knowledge promote knowledge so we have have um, a series of events, we have um, different ways that we're really trying to promote the work that we're doing and that of our members. Um, so I echo Regina's call, please do reach out to us if you want to connect. We're really looking for partners um, that can help us um, increase our knowledge, but also find the gaps. We do have um, a program and we're working on this um, with our members to determine what the priority areas are, what research should we be committing to, which activities should we be prioritizing, and also just to foster those exchanges that could then um, enable partners to connect and advance this agenda. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Tuga, for those uh, insightful uh, sharing of opportunities. Thank you and the work that you are doing. Um, without any much delay, um, over to you, Rose Koslinga. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you can go to the next slide, Mike. Um, my name is Rose Goslinga. I'm the co-founder and um, president at Pula. Uh, at Pula, we develop uh, climate resilient and food security for smallholder farmers through crop insurance against the risks of extreme weather. Um, we do that by designing and delivering innovative agriculture insurance and digital products. And that effectively helps farmers not only endure yield risks, but also improve their farm practices and bolster their incomes. We've done that for close to, this number is slightly outdated already, over 6 million farmers by now, 30% of which are, which are women, um, across 19 countries with close to 60 distribution partners, um, 40 insurance partners, and by now, uh, no longer eight reinsurance partners, but 24 reinsurance partners. Reinsurers have become one of our key kind of constituents. Um, what we've seen with, with women, what are the trends? Like, you know, if you insure like 6 million people, what, what, what do you see? Um, you know, what we see, like this is, is pretty country specific, actually. Like in Kenya, like 45% of our customers tend to be women, but in Nigeria, only like 10 to 20. Well, as in Malawi and Zambia, it's more like 30%. Um, and it's really defined by the route to market as well. Like we don't sell insurance by itself. We don't put insurance on the shelf and say, hey, come buy a really pretty shiny insurance. We sell it as kind of a, an embedded product. So how it's embedded really defines how people access it and therefore also whether women can access it. We've worked with a lot of very agri-focused microfinance institutions. Microfinance institutions tend to focus on women. And so there, our percentage of women was like 55, maybe 60%. Um, whereas if we go towards digital, and I'll talk a bit about that later, the access to smartphones or, or phones by itself was always lower for women. So there, are, our percentage of women participation was always lower. I'll go to the next slide. So, but even if you, like what we also see is like, even if, if, farmer, if women farmers have access to the same kind of, have access to insurance, have access to improved inputs, that doesn't necessarily guarantee they have the same kind of outcomes. Um, part of our insurance product is that we actually measure farmer yields. And we saw in Nigeria that farmers that have pretty much the same access to improved inputs still got between 10 to 20% lower yields than their male counterparts, given the same circumstances. So it points to that, like, like the differences lie deep. You can go to the next slide. So we've also kind of like, we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how does this product get to our customers? And if you think about how you want to reach the customers, I'd say like two, like distribution is really key and distribution is nearly king. 
put it this way. So while mobile phones are widespread, um, you know, if you go to if you go through mobile phones, you'll actually only reach like 60% of the farming population. You know, it just, you know, you're not going to get very, you're not going to get very far with women. But if you go for through a microfinance route, you know, you'll get to 70%, you know, 70% of your customers are going to be women. So it's, it's how you get there really matters. You can go to the next slide. And then, you know, and let's say you really, you like, we're all very enthusiastic about digital, we can see the potential for scale. What kind of digital also matters? Like we've looked at, you know, there's there's a disproportionate access um, to smartphones by men versus women. So if you're going to use any kind of messaging or digital tools, go for the simple kind of like lowest barrier entry tools. So SMS works really well, and farmers actually do read them, or we'll find somebody who can read them for them. Um, so we kind of like see that that is kind of if we want to target women and want to make sure that women understand our products, um, those are kind of the routes that we use. You can go to the next slide. We also kind of, um, you know, we've seen that um, across our like across our markets, we see that only like thirty percent of our customers are women. But we have seen that rise, and like what we've so we've gotten support from the Africa Digital Financial Inclusion Facility and African Development Bank Fund, supported by the Gates Foundation, to really kind of bridge that gap. Um, and like our targets and, and methods that we're using here are, are very kind of maybe sound very sim simple, but what we found in like in our surveys that farmers and women farmers in particular wanted to know exactly what this was covering. You know, so we used to call our product a yield insurance and they wanted it to be called a, you know, a loss of, because of flood insurance or a drought insurance. So they wanted kind of the risks to be part of the title. And um, they had a strong preference for physical, you know, physical branches. Um, they had, you know, like there's a number of different pieces that we found that were super interesting that, that we weren't necessarily thinking of. Like most of all, by the way, crop, like the type of crop that if you want to reach more women, the type of crop really mattered. We ended up going for a lot, ensuring a lot more ginger if we wanted to target more women, whereas rice also had more women in there, but maize had less women than we expected. What do we need to do now as a sector? Like, I think, you know, if you look at really growing women participation and, and women access to insurance, you know, like working with specialized agricultural microfinance institutions is really key like we have we have a shareholding of women's world banking which is really trying to work with us on how to care how to target and get microfinance institutions to lend to agriculture most of them have really focused on kind of the traditional trader women's group but getting working with microfinance institutions to actually lend to productive agriculture is something that is still really challenging for them but is really key for if we want to reach more women at the same time, you know, when we design our products, if we go through digital thinking through what the right methods are, I think as a sector is really key to, to bridge the gap. And that's all for me. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Rose, um, for sharing that um, fascinating highlights, especially um, reaching women, country, even, even with the country, it's, 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 it's important, the type of mobile phone and also the type of crops that you're targeting. Thank you very much. That is really insightful. And um, we are going to move further to, to the Q&A section now. And now um, we're happy, hopefully, uh, just to reiterate, please uh, send us your questions in the Q&A section and feel free to um, address your question to a specific speaker of your choice. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into all of them um, as soon as we can. And to kick that off, I think we have, for the first question, we have Rajat. And it says, is it possible to link crop insurance, weather insurance to health insurance? Is bundling of such portfolios feasible? Can the insurance be linked to positive health outcomes or health practices? In bracket, nutritional outcomes. I would pose this question to, to Sarah or Joanna. Joanna, do you want to take that? I know that you you already answered it in the chat there. If there's anything else you want to elaborate on, I know you answered both Rajat and Dennis, but anything you want to add there? Um, I, I don't think at a, at a high level, but just that, that there was quite, um, I mean, even though there was low uh, awareness of insurance in Nigeria, there was quite a lot of interest in it, and especially in terms of opportunity for maybe the private sector to engage, um, the, the bundling made sense. So there was interest for both um, kind of crop or, or um, weather type insurance and linked with health. 
um, that is a, an opportunity also potentially to, to help with the business case for this target market. Yeah, absolutely. And I can, I can just jump in there and add on because I saw another question that came in asking about if insurance tends to be a push versus rather than a pull product, how do we incentivize the private sector? Well, I would say plain and simple, we've built out such a strong business case around why insurers should be designing for women that take a look at the links that were shared there on IFC's you know, women's insurance page. We have the Schieffer Shield report, which is the full version of what Fatu's presentation was just really laid out kind of how much money is the market is leaving behind by not targeting women customers. And then you can go and read through, we have five different case studies across uh, Africa and Asia on one of the different clients that IFC's Women's Insurance Program has worked with. And within those case studies, we do provide specific numbers around how much money and how many new clients each of our insurance companies um, that IFC is engaged with to help design women specific strategies, how much money they've been able to gain by targeting it. So plain and simple is it's, that's why they should care. They should care not only because it's a good thing to do, but it is very good business. <laughs> it is very, very, very good business. So definitely direct you to the case studies um, that I shared in the chat earlier. Thank you very much. And um, my next question would be uh, posed to uh, Fatsuji. Um, based on the recent uh, research findings, it, it has shown that the traditional insurance is not tailored to meet women's gender specific needs. As you have done, observed in Nigeria, there's no record of development of insurance products specifically for the women by insurance. Is this a missed opportunity for, for, for insurance? and for socioeconomic development? And if so, what, what can insurance you know, and other sector stakeholders supporting implementation do to be more gender inclusive within their own institutions and operating models? Uh, thank you so much, Doris, and uh, glad to, to answer that question. And it kind of felt mm -hmm. uh, right, you know, can you hear me, sorry? Yes. Great, great, okay. right after. Yeah, what, what Sarah just said. You know, the insurance industry has been quite late in targeting women as a viable customer and distribution segment, and it's in globally, but also in Nigeria. And uh, it's about awareness, right? You can't resolve an issue when you are not aware of it. We, we talk about gender, we talk about women in general, but it's not a matter of a corporate social responsibility. As you've seen the opportunity that, was, that is shown in the She for Shield report, there's money out there. Women are not happy with the type of products that are being developed because insurers are developing gender neutral product and it doesn't speak to their life. It doesn't speak to the risks that they are facing. Meanwhile, they are more vulnerable to risk you know, like a loss of jobs or when they get divorced. So what is important is first for the sector to understand what the need is, what the women want and be able to develop products that are tailored to those needs. And to be able to do that, they need to do it internally, but also externally. Internally, that's mean being more gender sensitive um, in their own corporation. And that can be do, uh, done through different level, you know, being seen as the employer of choice, having flexible policies and, and so on, doing an edge certification, for example, and we can give more information on that. Because, you know, as they say, charities start at home. You need internally to be, to show that you are supportive to women and be able to go out there and place yourself as the preferred insurer, the insurer of choice for women after being the employer of choice. So be aware of it. And that's what our program have been doing, disseminating the She for Shield report, what we've seen as an opportunity. Uh, women segment is good business. It's not a corporate social responsibility. By diversifying, you can make much more money while also having a big impact on the social and economic side. Thank you so much, Doris. 
Thank you, Fatu, for that rich answer. And uh, my next question will be from Tabi, and uh, this is posed to Rose. Um, it says, women are traditionally involved in manual activities of agricultural value chains and are often excluded from marketing, financing and selling activities, which can help them access resources as well as information about financial products, including insurance. How can service delivery of insurance be designed to address this gap? Back to you, Rose. Yeah, I, I was just looking for the unmute button. I think, you know, um, as I said, the entry, the entry, um, the entry point is really, is really key. And what we see is that, you know, the point where a customer, whether it's a woman or man, like the customer has to hand over money, you know, that's kind of the point where you need to get them at. And, you know, and where and, and how they come in when they have money is really key. So as mentioned, like, you know, we, we tried something with seed and fertilizer companies, but we're, we're finding that you know, the point of the purchase, the person, the person who goes and purchases seed and fertilizer is usually the man who drives the car, who do, does all those different pieces. So if you want to kind of reach out to women and, and like, you know, recognizing that they, they probably do do the work on the farm and that they, are, that they are involved in the sales, then you have to think about that point and how you, you know, tap into that particular point. I'll just also like answer another question that I saw in the chat. You know, we we really believe in 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 working with government around scale up. I think, you know, it, it's I found sometimes in the past it's not the most like um, popular thing to say, but you know, the governments and the countries that we work in have probably the widest outreach when it comes to agriculture and like have a large extension service network for a lot of like kind of the trusted advisors to farmers. And so we really see that that is key to actually you know, reaching out to more farmers and getting to scale. Sometimes what I found, like, you know, like some of our development partners would say, I want you to reach at least 50 50% 50 women. And, you know, we want you to reach 100,000 farmers. And I'm like, well, let me reach 200,000 farmers because then I can get to your 50,000. Because, you know, getting to scale sometimes is, is the game of, of getting to the number numbers that we want to. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes people find this interesting, like, like why in some markets are women like more represented on the farm than men? And I, I've, I've given quite a bit of thought to this and at some point you see that as 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 the the gdp per farmer or gdp per household rises you also see the participation of women farmers becoming more pronounced and becoming more kind of on the foreground you know they become the people who buy the inputs they become the people who own all the different tools that we're using to reach out to them so I, i'm pretty confident that like in the long term as we see incomes rise you know that women participation will also improve and increase um, but you know if we want to accelerate that and then you have to be very targeted and, and very deliberate. Sorry for a long answer, but I answered two questions. Well, thank you very much, Russ. That's um, that's great. Thank you for hitting the two. And my next question will be for Otuga. And um, this is based on the information you've shared so far. So from the research you gathered to date, what action is needed to better integrate gender consideration in climate risk insurance? Thank you very much. And I have to say, you know, um, the work that the IFC has done to change the conversation, looking at the opportunity that this provides, rather than having this, you know, women as victims and vulnerable, and we need to just include them because that's the nice thing to do, which is true. But it's also, it goes so much beyond that and makes a strong case that allows us to connect the private sector to the private sector in a different way. And I've seen some questions relating to this, looking at how this could be, how the private sector could be incentivized to develop these projects. Within the partnership, we have um, discussed this with a number of the, those implementing these solutions. And one of the projects that comes to mind is in Madagascar, one of our partners, GIZ, um, the German uh, Technical Corporation. They're working with the Ministry of Finance and the Metrological Agency in a project called PRADA, which is an acronym for um, Adaptation Project in French. Um, and they actually it was unintended that they would have so many uh, women clients in this project, but they had it was so based on um, a very inclusive approach. They start they have three pillars to this work, one of them being sensitization, information sharing, um, risk information, and they developed um, a, a game actually that could be very easily used um, um, on people's phones. And they found that the uptake 
rows of women unexpectedly. So now they have really good indicators, but it was not really intended to be a gender focused project. So we're really looking at about what happened there, what are the steps, and you find that it's to do with the distribution, it's to do with the community engagement that took place before that. And women appear to be very engaged and willing when approached in the correct way, in a way that suited them. Um, and so for us, you know, the Centre of Excellence is really trying to look at this. Number one, we look at the case that is made, for example, the IFC's reports, looking at how there is, you know, a case for the private sector to really look in this direction. We work with governments, as Rose has just said, we work with um, academia to try and really unlock the potential. We're, we're talking to two other organizations that are also developing interesting games that they think could increase access and understanding of climate risk insurance. Um, and then just the center of excellence is really trying to bring that together, what is needed. So where are the knowledge gaps? Where are the tools? Um, and how do we ensure that um, this knowledge is shared among different stakeholders. Thank you, Tuga. Thank you very much. And as we're having um, a number of questions coming in, um, this is not addressed to any specific speaker, so feel free to jump in, any of you. Uh, that would be nice. And, and the question is from Peace Chandini. It says, many of the financial institutions are profit-oriented as opposed to providing a service for women. How do we bridge the gap between financial institutions looking out for profit versus developing products that address the specific needs of women? Yes, Doris, I would like to take that, please. This is Fatu. Thank you, Fatu. Okay. Yes, I started in the chat, and what I wanted to, um, to say to Peace is that it should be the same thing. What I mean is that the women market is not uh, nice to do, nice to have, uh, social responsibility kind of approach. You are entering the women's market and you need to demonstrate that you can make money out of it. So you are killing, a, a, you know, you are using a stone to kill two birds. One, you are making revenue, but at the same time also you are addressing that gender gap. You know, you are um, providing the much needed type of service, tailored service that the different segment of women need. So, uh, if you develop a product for the working mother, you are developing for the low income, uh, uh, the retiree or the millennials, you can't do it as a one size fits all. And when the women see that this is what I need, this is what I want, and this insurance company is giving it to me, they will buy. Not only they will buy, they will also buy for their family and they will talk about it and it will be uh, marketing, free marketing for you. And what does it mean? Increase in revenue, increase in the number of new customers you will be having and increase in the, um, you know, your, your premium. So it should be seen as one, making revenue by understanding better the market to be able to fulfill the need of the different segments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fatou. Excellent. And uh, to, to Sarah, Oh, Joanna, um, we have a question from Nikita. It says, I would like to understand more about women's capacity to take decisions independently. Do we also need to take dedicated efforts to influence secondary stakeholders like husbands or other influential family members? In, in our, I can speak to kind of women's insurance work more broadly, and then Joanna, you can supplement this with anything kind of from the Nigeria research specifically. But in our on the ground work with ISC, we've actually found that women, even if they say they're going to, you know, consult with their husbands at home, it's mostly they use that as an excuse because they felt pressured during the sales process and that they actually want to take a second to step back and actually gather more information and truly understand if it is the right solution for them and for their families. We've found that um, having a actually sales agents be less pressuring and actually more just providing information and actually getting to better understand women's needs, that that's been a more successful kind of approach in terms of providing information, having pamphlets, having websites, having and of the sales process built around giving women the time and the space to be able to digest the information on their own. Because anecdotally, women have told us 
it's they use that ex, that opportunity of oh I need to go talk to my family just as a chance to step away from the process and be able to fully digest it. Um, Joanna, did you have any other observations on the on the ground in Nigeria specifically with you know rural or smallholder farmer? Um, no, nah, nothing that contradicts what you said. I mean, only I think emphasizing that it's it's maybe not about whether they make the decision, but that they, they need the information, they need to be educated, especially on the financial literacy side. That, that's more the, the point that needs to be addressed um, because they, yeah, they, are, they, they do have in some cases a percentage have savings and are, are making the, the head of household decisions. Um, so it's, it's a focus on, on, like Sarah said, providing the, the right information in the right way. Um, so in, in the case of Nigeria, that's much more one-on-one -on -one contact, so communication, um, or, or through kind of um, cha local champions um, that, that can help facilitate their decision-making process. Yeah, and I see, I'd love to hear, Rose, your perspective on this. If, it, if in Pula's work, you've seen any, any anecdotal evidence, and then there's also a couple of questions directed at Rose in the chat that if you want to browse through those and, and, and pick those up as well. That'd be great. Yes, I was, I was going to get to Rose. We have two questions for Rose incoming. Um, and, and Rose, these are, uh, I have two quick questions. It says, um, do you see the role of state in scaling up the model, especially through social security measures? Then the, the second one is from Zalelin. It says, Radio and ICT based technologies like SMS, voice messages, ETC should be tried to create mass awareness in insurance basic concept as it is new to many smallholders. So, okay, I think I'm not sure that's a question. So, the first one is from Ruchi. Yeah. Yeah, so, so as mentioned, like we, we definitely, we just launched a, a program in Mozambique that is definitely in partnership with kind of like a social safety net function. Um, and so we definitely see that there is a that there is potential for that, um, and and we're definitely pursuing that in other markets as well. Um, it requires a pretty forward thinking like um, state government and, and, and bureaucrats effectively that see this as, as a potential route uh, route to scale. Um, they have to be convinced about insurance as well, of course. And, um, I would say in terms of if you're thinking about digital technology and tools. So for example, we did um did some interesting work with um, IVR in. Um, I can't remember what it's like. It's it, it's basically you know it's like a robocall, right? I'm trying to remember what the what the acronym stands for. Something instance voice recording, something like that. Um, and there's some interesting insights that we saw on that. So for example, compared to SMS, what farmers like about SMS is that they can keep it and reread it, whereas with an IVR, it, it comes to you once, and then if they haven't captured all the information, they can't really call back, like or get the same message again. So that was a downside of that. You can't really save the IVR or you can feature them. Um, and so like, surprisingly, we often went back to SMS because of that. Um, so there's you know, there's upsides and downsides to different pieces of technology. And yeah, so it's, you really have to kind of like think through and, and test it out. And, and we, in our team, we have a kind of a, a dedicated team that does human-centered design and thinks through like you know if, if we sent an IVR how does a farmer farmer kind of looks at that and is like wow this is something new so it gets everybody's attention so they pay good attention to this new thing but if they didn't gather it the first time and they were kind of shocked that this was kind of a robot talking to them and trying to talk back to it then it might also not necessarily have a desired impact anyway so those are some of our insights on that thank you Rose thank you very much for the response and um we have uh, one question, it says from Uvashi, it says, this conversation leads to a larger challenge of financial inclusion of women across the world. How do we tackle the agency of women to speak about finance and money issues? There are so many cultural differences that also lead to so many challenges in scale. Yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm, looking, I'm, I'm looking through the chat for that question because it was a lot packed in there, but I think to answer it quite simply is that scale is achievable, but it does require 
local customized solutions. So what works in Kenya is absolutely not going to work in Nigeria. What we're in, even if we look kind of what works for a woman in Lagos that is a, is, you know, a working mother is going to be very different than what works for the women smallholder farmers that we just conducted research on. And that's one of the big lessons learned um, from kind of IFC's work in this area is that the solutions need to be, you know, customized for the subgroups within women, because women is not one segment. We have, you know, the need a millennial woman, a working mother, a woman closer to retirement, a woman that owns a small business, a woman that's in a rural versus an urban area. And then our Rose main mention to human-centered design. Incorporating human-centered design methodology has truly been the bread and butter of really empathizing, understanding the needs of women, going into those sub-segments and really not creating a one-size-fits-all solution, but really having it be, you know, tailored solutions for each of the women's sub-segments within a particular market. And so if you, you know, to go to link it back to the question, if we are looking at achieving scale, the successful way to do it is not through, you know, taking one solution and trying to reach as many women with it, because women will see through that. They'll know that it's just a copy and paste and a different marketing technique and a different, in a different way to try to get them to buy it and that it really isn't serving their needs. So I would say, look at the women's subsegments, understand their needs, and then design for those needs in terms of insurance, and then also look at their preferences in terms of distribution. And that sounds like, okay, more work than we're used to, but this is absolutely something where, again, I'll point everyone back to the case studies. There you can see the proof is in the pudding in terms of how the work has paid off in terms of being able to um, increase penetration. And, and Fatu, I see your hands up. So over to you for additional comments. Yeah. You feel equally passionate about this. <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much, Sarah. I just wanted to, uh, that's a very interesting question. And I was doing the same, going through the chat to look through it. And, uh, you know, um, at the IFC, what we have been doing is working with insurance companies to help them be able to understand better their markets, disaggregate their portfolio and develop uh, solutions. And of course, train them in gender sensitivity and all that. But what we've seen the past seven years doing that it's so hands on that we uh, don't do many at the time. And what we've did, we, we did was creating a community of practice with the ILO and it helped us um, reach 21 companies in 16 different countries. And what we put out there were the fundamentals. This is what you need to build to be able to respond to um, the women's need. And what is expected is them going back, looking at it and, be, and saying, okay, I'm in Kenya. This is the way I have to do it for it to work. I'm in Bangladesh, I will do it this way. Because as Sarah said, it, it needs to be tailored to that market, but the fundamental is the same. You need to build the knowledge internally, externally. You need to um, develop tailored product using human-centered design. You need to improve your distribution, linking it to digital, linking it to partnership, and you need to train your staff, your agent in gender sensitivity to understand better how to sell to women. Just wanted to add that. Thank you. Thank you, Fatu, for jumping in there. That's a, a, a great perspective. Thank you so much. I see your hand up to that, please. Yes, I mean, I think it's a fantastic question. And um, I really appreciate the answers from Sarah and Fatu. And I think there needs to be two things. So on the one hand, we need to develop frameworks in terms of how project design should start to think about the, the different considerations, what kind of engagement they should make. And then the sec second part of it is really to start to build out that evidence, to try and build out that knowledge, which is different in different regions, different sectors, different types of women in different circumstances. And in the center of excellence, we have this guidance pillar where we're really looking at, um, you know, sort of what, project cycle should look like and where the different questions should be asked 
in the design implementation and in the evaluation of a project. But on, in parallel to that, we're partnering with grassroots organizations. We've got a project coming up in India where we're working very specifically in a very niche area um, with a grassroots organization to try and understand how they've overcome um, distribution questions related to insurance with women. Um, and then we're also looking at reviews, regional reviews. So we did a review, the World Bank actually in the Pacific, looking at the policy frameworks that enable inclusive insurance and gender inclusive insurance in different countries and where there might be barriers. Um, and we hope to replicate that in different regions and countries. Um, and also just to be connected, if there's a if someone's listening here and they feel that there's a story that to be told, we'd love to pull that out and write it up and you know share it in case there's a, another project that could really benefit from these uh, case studies. Thank you very much to that. And I think our very last question um, will be to, to Rose on, on how Pula has been successful in signing up a lot of women farmers in Nigeria, Zambia, and Ethiopia. So we want to know how, what are the key steps you have taken to build to build or to increase proximity to women clients and to gain them to gain their trust to sign up for insurance products as trust is the key issue for women trust is a key issue for insurance it's not a key issue for women man like it's it's like the core of insurance there's no such thing of insurance without trust and nobody trusts insurance so you know so um I think, look, the, the answer to this is, like, I think is the answer to insurance, right? The answer to this is scale. Look, if, you're, if your products, you know, I think anything in insurance has, has two elements to it, product and distribution. So the product needs to make sense, whether it's a product, and I, I'm going to sound very unpopular here, and, and my, some of my, my women, uh, women-centered shareholders will say, you know, you don't necessarily design products for women. We design products for scale. Like, and, and let me, and we design products for profitability. Um, and I'm not embarrassed to say that. Like, I think like as you get to scale and as you get to profitability, you start reaching more women. Like in, like I know, like because I get invited to events like this, I know exactly what, like what to answer and what to say about, okay, hey, this is how you get to more women. And like, it may sound cynical when I say that, but like, we know we get to like, you know, out of you know, 6 million, 30% women is close to 2 million women, right? Um, and we got there because we are, unabashedly focused on scale. And if you, you know, if 30% of, 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 you know, of, of 10 people is only three, but 30% of 6 million people is 2 million people. So, you know, like I would say our, our, our focus and, and getting to women is, is to think about how you scale for insurance, because then you also, as I said, like it should be, it should be good, you know, it should be good business. So we will look at, hey, which cooperate, like sometimes we're like, hey, if we want to particularly get at more women, we'd look at the saying, hey, we should then really look at those kind of cross way of communication. We should go for kind of like the easiest, no frame, no barrier and like uh, entry level kind of education if it's talking to digital. If we want to get to women, we really need to support, um, you know, how to get to, we need to support like how microfinance institutions, which have been very successful about getting to women, can get into financing agriculture. Those are kind of our key things if we specifically want to be deliberate about getting to more women. But like my best answer for this so far is scale. So how do you get to scale through your programs? You know, I one of my first jobs, I worked for the Ministry of Agriculture of Rwanda. And in Rwanda has, has knowingly has a huge percentage of people on the national health insurance scheme. And how do they get there? Like, I'm going to tell a slight story here. We found that, you know, like I used to live in Rwanda and on Saturday morning, my village or my, my, my communal leader would call me up and say, Rose, why are you not at, at, why are you not at our community work activity yet? We're, you know, we're fixing the potholes this week. And I was like, Ice man, I've been partying the night before. I, I want to sleep in kind of thing. And, but he would be like, no, no, you have to show up. And if you were Rwandan, you'd get in trouble. What kind of trouble? I would not be able. If I didn't show up for my community health working health or health community like kind of uh, work, I couldn't get a passport. I couldn't get access to certain like services. I couldn't get if I was you know I couldn't get kind of social services. And if you showed up, then you know the first thing they asked you is like as Iran, and they would ask you, do you have your health insurance card? Have you signed up for your health insurance? So there was enormous kind of like social control and like systems that tugged for this. 
And if we think about this as, as a community, like I'm always challenging our team to look at, okay, what are the administrative pieces that we can put in place? What are the services that we care about so that we get our insurance products to scale? You know, somebody asked me about how can we get livestock insurance to, to how can we get people to co-pay? And often the answer in these kind of forms is about we need to educate people better. Like, you know, I'm gonna go around here, but like, you know, in uh, agriculture insurance in the US until the 1980s, and all these farmers are extremely well educated. It was like in the you know, 10, 9, 10, like maybe around the 10%. It went to, in the 80s, it went to 90% because only if you had access to, you know, or if you were co paying, you, get, you could get like FEMA, like which is a disaster risk insurance. And this was for extremely well educated people. So this was never a question about education. This is about like carrot and sticks. And I think as a, as a sector and as, as leaders in this sector, we need to think very carefully what those carrots and sticks are. And when we get to those, and when we think about those, then we get to scale and then we reach a lot of work. Um, thank you very much, Rose. And as we're getting to the close of, our, uh, of, of this section, uh, before we say our goodbyes today, um, I want to give all our speakers just about a few seconds to just give us your last points, to share your, to, uh, share your last final thoughts to, with the audience. Um, we can start with uh, Regina and then Fatuji, Sarah, Tuga, and Rose. Well, thank you very much for um, giving me the opportunity to, to say a few last words. It was a very interesting session um, with uh, a great insight into on the ground work and seeing what is possible, but also to, to be aware of the challenges and constraints that are still existing. So thank you very much to the organizers for this very interesting event, but also for the panelists um, for presenting their work. Um, over to you, thanks. Thank you, Regina. Thank you, everybody. Um, this was a very interesting discussion and uh, my um, word to, to close it will be resilience. We need to be resilient and continue building awareness. Without awareness, uh, we won't be able to do much. So we have to keep showing the opportunities, keep sharing um, the, what we are learning throughout the, our different projects. Um, so many organizations doing great things. Let's work together. Let's share what we are learning throughout our journey and be able to do more for the financial inclusion for gender equality. So thank you so much and passing it over to Sarah. Thank you, Fatu. So I might sound like a broken record <laughs> based on what I previously said, but I think that the, the presentation that I shared which was focused on insurance needs of women smallholder farmers in rural Nigeria and rural, rural agribusiness SME owners is just one example of one type of in-depth market research that can be done to better understand the needs and preferences of women. And I encourage everyone that's on the meeting today that does have women customers to please, please look into how you can segment, how you can better understand their needs because the return on investment in doing this type of work is, is immense. So definitely, um, definitely pushing that forward as my final message. Thank you. Oh, sorry. I thought it was yeah. Joanne. And, um, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me and thank you to the other speakers uh, for very insightful presentations. I think, it, you know, when we have these discussions, sometimes it feels like the journey ahead is very long. We're still so far from where we want to be. But it's really encouraging to hear some very practical um, experiences and examples um, where um, work is being done to address the gender gaps. And um, as you say, we should work together and um, we look forward to doing that. And over to you, Rose. I think Rose, over to you. Thank you. Yeah, like, look, it's fun to be part of this all women panel. Um, and it's always a pleasure. Like, um, all men panel are pretty normal, so but I'm still going to celebrate that we were all women panel and with so much great insights and and, and positive like perspectives on this. Um, yeah, uh, and like you know, I think we're all like big advocates of insurance. I always love to be like on a panel with all insurance nerds, like and we can all nerd out over that we love this really weird product that nobody really wants, but maybe not even us never really want. Like I've never woken up thinking I really need a new pair of insurance. Um, but it, so at the same time, um, this was a real pleasure. And I hope you all enjoyed us, us geeking out over this kind of stuff. So I hope to see you again soon. Bye. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I wanted to say thank you to our speakers, our panelists, and audience for your valuable contribution to, to this gender section. And also to BMZ, Asia Resilience Social uh, Global Secretariat, thank you for your continuous uh, support for GIF's key initiatives and projects over the years. Also, a special thanks to my team, to the IFC, uh, who worked tirelessly both behind the scenes and on screen to make sure this is, event was a success. Uh, but to A, Anne, uh, thank you, Celine, Sandra, uh, Sarah, and the Agromondis team, we thank you. Also, especially uh, our deepest gratitude to, goes to Ariel and the whole Sign Cup team for making this a successful event. Thank you all. And we hope we've all learned something from hearing from our speakers. And as well as the audience, this has educated me and I'm sure everyone here on how insurance as a development tool can help developing countries bridge the gender gap and promote economic growth. You know, um, I'm certain that the takeaways from this session will help shape the industry's focus on its contribution to better cater for women's needs. So again, thank you all. And this brings us to the end of this session. Enjoy the rest of the Sankap Summit. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you.